In video 69 of Tinter Calculus, we'll continue our analysis of the Christoffel symbol as it relates to surfaces and curved manifolds. Back in video 28, we introduced the Christoffel symbol using the expression you see here. Then uh, later on in video 32, we ran into this expression. And we said given the definition for the Christoffel symbol like this, we could use the same Christoffel symbol this way to uh, represent this expression. Now, these are very similar expressions, if you'll notice. This index is on the bottom, while this is on the top. This is a covariant basis. This is a contravariant basis. We said we can use the Christoffel symbol for both of these expressions, as long as we change this to a, a negative. This one's positive up here. And we change the meaning of our uh, dummy indexes. The dummy indexes go this way here. They go this way here. Okay, well, in the last video, we found out that this expression by itself is not enough for surface manifolds. If we're going to make this work for surface manifolds, we have to add this term over here. We said that this uh, expression right here will result in a vector which is likely to point in any direction and therefore has to have not only this surface projection, but also a normal projection. Well, that having been said, we can make the same argument right here. This uh, would be expected to produce a vector in any direction, and therefore not only does it, we have to have a surface projection here, but we need some other term here as well to represent the full expression. So that's what we want to explore in this video. But instead of doing a similar kind of analysis we did in the last video, what we're going to do here is to use this expression and derive the proper expression right here. So to do that, we'll start with this expression. We've got the partial derivative of our covariant basis, S lambda, with respect to S beta. But what I'm going to do is to make a substitution. We're going to take the partial with respect to S beta, but instead of S lambda here, I'm going to replace it with our covariant metric tensor term of S lambda omega times the contravariant basis vector S omega. So what's in the parentheses here is the expression we'd use to lower the omega index into the lower position, giving us S lambda. So this is the exact equivalent of S lambda. And of course, I have to use the product rule here to evaluate it. So we'll take the partial of the first factor with respect to S beta, holding the second factor constant. And then we'll have the first factor, S lambda omega, times the partial derivative of our second factor, the contravariant basis vector, S omega. Okay. So that's going to give us, then, the partial derivative of S lambda with respect to S beta being equal to everything over here. But uh, from previous videos, we know that the partial derivative of this first expression is simply gamma omega lambda beta plus gamma lambda omega beta. So this expression in the parentheses is the exact equivalent of this partial derivative of our covariant metric tensor. And of course, we've got uh, this factor left, and we've got this last term, S lambda omega times the partial of S omega with respect to S beta. So all I've done is to replace this uh, factor right here with its equivalent right there. Okay, so uh, now what I want to do is to switch sides of the equation. So we'll put this term first. We'll have uh, S lambda omega times our partial derivative of our contravariant basis vector. And that's going to be um, then equal to our partial derivative of our covariant basis vector with respect to S beta. And then we'll subtract the rest of this from both sides. So to complete it, we'd have minus gamma omega lambda beta, and we'll go ahead and distribute this vector term right here. 
and then minus the second term, which is gamma lambda omega beta times s omega. So what we have now is s lambda omega times our partial derivative of our contravariant basis vector with respect to s beta. And this time, I'm going to substitute the expression that we derived in the last video for this partial of our covariant basis vector right here. We said that this is going to be equal to gamma omega lambda beta times s omega plus our curvature tensor lambda beta times n hat. So what I've written down here is the equivalent of our partial derivative right there. Okay, now this next term, notice that omega is a dummy index. And as with any such expression, we can flip-flop the position of the indexes here. So I'm going to raise the omega index and lower it over here. So this term now is going to look like this. It's going to be minus gamma omega in the upper position, lambda beta, times s omega in the lower position. So I've simply raised the omega index here and lowered it there. And then we have our last term. Okay, and while I'm doing this, you probably already spotted why I did that, because you can see that uh, this term right here cancels this one out. So those two disappear, and we're left with only these two terms on the right-hand side. Okay, we're almost done. The only thing we have left here is to get rid of this factor out front so we can isolate this term right here. And you probably already see how we're going to do that. We're going to contract both sides of our expression here with the contravariant metric tensor. So we will multiply both sides by S alpha lambda. So this factor times the left-hand side of S lambda omega times the partial derivative of S omega with respect to S beta. And of course, I have to do the same thing on all terms here. So I'll put this uh, this term next. We're going to multiply by S alpha lambda times gamma lambda omega beta times S omega. And the only other remaining term is this one. So it's S alpha lambda times our curvature tensor B lambda beta times n hat. Okay, you've seen this movie before. These two terms right here are going to yield a delta alpha omega, and the omega index here is going to be absorbed, leaving us with an alpha index up there. So that's going to clean the left-hand side up just to be the partial derivative of S alpha with respect to S beta. Okay, here this is what we use to raise the lambda index up into the upper position, giving us alpha. And the same thing happens over here. This will raise the index up into this upper position. So our final expression is going to be this. It's the partial derivative of S alpha, the uh, delta factor having absorbed omega to give us alpha, with respect to S beta. And on the right-hand side, we're going to raise this index up. And I'll also switch the order of the lower indexes. So this will give us gamma alpha beta omega times S omega. And the last term is just going to raise the lambda index in the upper position, giving us our curvature tensor with one index raised to alpha in the upper position right here. And that's the expression that we're looking for. So we started our discussion with this expression right here. We said we needed to add a term that's going to accommodate the fact that this vector may lie in any direction. Well, this is the extra term right over here. So now, as we expected, we know that we have to modify this expression by adding this term. So just like this case, this is a vector that may point in any direction so we need a surface projection and a normal projection. 
and the same is true here. This may point in any direction, so we need a surface projection and a normal projection here. But notice how uh, clean and consistent these results are. In both cases, we form our surface projection by using the Christoffel symbol in conjunction with our surface basis vectors here. And uh, in the case of the normal projection, we use our curvature tensor in conjunction with our normal basis vector here. Now, the only difference is that in the second case, one of the indexes is in the upper position. And that makes perfect sense because uh, in the first case, up here, alpha and beta are both lower indexes, so they have to be lower indexes in every term. They're free indexes, and they have to be consistent throughout the entire expression. Well, likewise, here, alpha is an upper index, and it has to be in the upper position in all the terms, beta being a lower index, so it's got to be in the lower position. Okay, so the good news is that we only need one Christoffel symbol for both cases, and we need only one curvature tensor that works in both cases. The only difference is that we raise the index here to make it work in this case. All right, with all that having been said, let's move on to one final topic. I want to show you how we can evaluate our Christoffel symbols for surface manifolds directly from the Christoffel symbols of our ambient coordinates in conjunction with the shift tensor. We'll start with our new definition of the Christoffel symbol. This time I want to make some substitutions using our uh, shift tensor. So uh, S alpha here is the same as Z alpha I times ZI like this. So that's the equivalent of S alpha. And then our partial derivative with respect to S omega, we'll make a substitution for S beta here. And that's going to be Z j beta times zj like this. So all I've done is to substitute the equivalent values for our basis vectors in the surface with uh, the equivalent using our shift tensor and the, the normal basis vectors here. Okay, now on the right-hand side, of course, I've got this partial derivative. I have to use the product rule here. So we'll expand that out. We'll have gamma alpha beta omega equal to z alpha i z i dotted with uh, this expression. So I'll open the parentheses here. We'll take the partial derivative of the first factor. So the partial of z j beta with respect to s omega times z j. And then we'll hold the first term constant here z j z j beta times the partial derivative of our second term here. But this time, instead of just the partial derivative of, of z j with respect to s omega, I'm going to use a chain rule. So let me use um, the partial of z k with respect to s omega times the partial of zj with respect to zk. So don't want to lose you here. This expression right here is the equivalent of the partial derivative of this with respect to s omega. I've just introduced this term right here and used a chain rule. OK, so let's continue on. We've got. Uh, gamma, alpha, beta, omega. And now we'll distribute the dot product here. So we're going to have z alpha i. And I'll use this uh, next term as the second term here. Partial of z j beta with respect to s omega. And then the dot product between z i and z j is just going to be delta ij. So that's the dot product of this first term. Now I'll take the dot product of the second one. And this time, uh, let me collect this term first, zi, and dot it with our partial derivative over here, partial of zj 
with respect to zk. All right, and then all of the other terms. I've got the z alpha i over here, and then I've got z j beta right here, and I've got this partial derivative left, but this is just, uh, this partial derivative by definition is simply z k omega. It's our shift tensor. Okay, so finally we have this form. We've got gamma, alpha, beta, omega is equal to our first term. And here the, the delta factor absorbs the J index. So we wind up with this final form, Z alpha I times the partial derivative of Z I beta because the J index has been absorbed with respect to S omega. So that's our first term. On the right side, this expression right here is simply our Christoffel symbol for our ambient space. It is the Christoffel symbol IJK. And then each of these terms follow. Z alpha I, Z J beta, and Z K omega. All right, so what I've got here then is an expression that allows us to use our shift tensor combined with the known Christoffel symbol values in the ambient space to derive the Christoffel symbols in the surface uh, geometry. So our Christoffel symbol here can be derived from these values right here directly. And one final comment, and that is that if Z itself, the ZI is an affine coordinate system, then the second term drops out because all the Christoffel symbols are zero, and we're left with just the first term. So this gives us a way of converting from the Christoffel symbols in the ambient space to the Christoffel symbols in the surface space uh, combined with our shift tensors. That gives us a conversion that we can perform directly. So by way of uh, review, the first thing we did in the video was to derive this expression right here. Now, this expression is very similar to what we did in the previous video. The difference is that the index here is in the upper position. In video uh, 68, we dealt with the covariant basis vector. Here we're dealing with the contravariant basis vector. But just like that case, we found that the expression that we started with right here is not sufficient for uh, the general case for surface manifolds. And that's because this uh, result here may be a vector that points in any direction. And therefore, we need this additional term right out here. So we have an expression now for a general vector that has a surface projection and a normal projection right here. And the good news is that the component for our normal uh, component right here is uh, the same tensor that we've discovered for use in video 68. We don't need a new tensor here. It's still the curvature tensor. It's just a tensor with the uh, one of the indexes in the upper position. OK, the next thing we did was to derive this expression. And this um, gives us a means of starting with our Christoffel symbol in the ambient coordinate system combined with the shift tensors of our embedded space. And uh, using those elements, we're able to derive the Christoffel symbol for our surface manifolds. So uh, it gives us another method of coming up with our Christoffel symbols in the surface manifold. We can just start with the known values in the ambient coordinate system and calculate the values according to this formula. Now, if the um, I made mention of the fact that if the coordinate system, the ambient coordinate system, is an affine coordinate system, then all of the Christoffel symbols are zero. So this term drops out. And this is the only expression that remains, provided zi is an affine coordinate system. So we can use this expression by itself in this special case to derive our Christoffel symbols for our surface manifolds. In the next video, We'll see how the results of this video and the previous one apply to each of our sample surfaces.